Good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Corina Cori Gutstadt from uh, Hamburg University, uh, where she is a lecturer of Turkish studies, but uh, her field of research is uh, uh, more specific because she uh, deals a lot with the memory of the Holocaust in Turkey and also with the various minorities in uh, the Ottoman Empire and Turkey, uh, Armenians, Kurds, uh, Alevis, and other uh, minorities uh, that had some uh, troubles in uh, the Ottoman Empire or in modern Turkey. She, last year she was a resident uh, researcher at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mendel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. Uh, besides her activity in Hamburg University, she's also um, an important member of the Anna Frank Centrum in Berlin. And uh, she published a lot of uh, books and articles on the memories connected with the memories of several uh, nations, uh, victims of uh, persecutions and uh, um, genocides. Uh, she recent, recently, uh, two years ago, published a very important book about Turkey, the Jews, and the Holocaust. And now I uh, uh, have this book, uh, which is a collect collective book entitled Wege ohne Heimkehr, die Armenia, der Erste Weltkrieg und die Folgen. Uh, Roads Without Return, the Armenians, the first, uh, the World War I, and the, the consequences, the um, results. Uh, she was also active in um, the publication of um, a, a book, a projected book, uh, to be published in the Beate and Serge Klasfeld Foundation, uh, entitled Hayat Yolare, Ölüm Yolare, Pass of uh, uh, Live Pass of Death. And uh, today, uh, Dr. Uh, Gutstadt will speak about politics and memory receptions of the Holocaust in Turkey. Um, please, the floor is yours. Oops. Yes, thank you for this nice introduction. Thank you all for coming, although it's a nice evening outside and not such a pleasant topic I'm going to talk on. And uh, I have to add, actually, I'm current um, a research fellow at Yad Vashem, and I have to thank them to invite me to Israel. So that's an opportunity to be here with you. For some years, the Holocaust is present in Turkish politics and public. Since 2011, the Jewish community organized commemoration at the International Holocaust Remembrance Day that were attended by some politicians. And this year, for the very first time, the commemoration was celebrated in an official manner in Ankara, with several state officials delivering speeches. Furthermore, Turk politicians participated in the commemoration in Auschwitz for the 70th anniversary of its liberation. And Turkey is, moreover, a candidate for membership in the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Given the strength of denialist positions in several Middle East countries, one might consider these developments in Turkey as positive steps. However, if we have a closer look at Turkey's approach regarding the Holocaust, it soon becomes obvious that the Holocaust is, as such is hardly ever mentioned. Most declarations and publications focus on alleged tolerance and rescue activities by Turkey. Looking at the statement delivered by Turkish politicians on these occasions, we find almost identical wordings. For example, just as the Ottoman Empire took in the Jews, drove them out of Spain, Turkey prevented its Jews being sent to concentration camps, and Turkey became a safe haven from persecution for Jews of all social classes. And, most importantly, 
There is no genocide in our history. So in breath, Turkey always saved the Jews and did not commit genocide. Another example of this kind of self-presentation is the film Turkish Passport that was produced with partly financial aid of the Turkish Foreign Ministry and since it released in 2011 has been screened in several countries on the initiative of Turkish diplomats and often in their presence. So it might be considered somehow as Turkish official self-representation and here you read Turkey was the only country to take a stand against the Holocaust, which is quite a big um, statement. Beside the more general advertising of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire being always tolerant towards Jews and all citizens, the main claims regarding Turkey, Turkey's politics during the Holocaust are the following. First, Turkey generously welcomed Jewish refugees. Turkish diplomats dip distributed nationality papers among former Turkish citizens or Jews whose citizenship was not clarified in order to save them or to protect them. And finally, Turkish diplomats rescued Jews by organizing their return in trains to Turkey. In my presentation, I will first review Turkey's politics during the Holocaust and then have a look on the reception in Turkey. Before going into the topic, I would like to point to some of the obstacles while working on this topic. First and very important is the inaccessibility of most Turkish archives. So, of course, I have hundreds and thousands and ten thousands of documents of other archives, but we have very few insight in inner Turkish discussions. The second point is that most Turkish scholars know almost nothing on the Holocaust, and reciprocally, Holocaust researchers normally have very few clues on Turkey. And furthermore, one problem is that the Holocaust is the catastrophe of the 20th century, or possibly the most cataclysmic event in modern human history, has lured historians into an anachronistic view of history in which events that took place in the 30s are assessed through the lens of what we know today. Contrary to this, my analysis emphasizes that Turkey's policies concerning Jews during the period of the Holocaust can only adequately be explained as a consequence of Turkey's own policies. In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, Turkey was preparing to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the founding of the Republic. In the new built Turkish Republic, like other new nation states, especially in Eastern Europe, the process of nation building brought a rigid nationalism. A policy of Turkification was designed to ensure Turkish Muslim predominance in all areas of society, economy, society, and population, culture. Jews and members of other minorities were subjected to occupational bans and a rank of restrictive laws regarding freedom of movement, and etc. A central aim was to increase the numerical predominance of the Muslim Turkish population, which was already nearly 99%, and the forcible assimilation of people regarded as non-Turks. During the 30s, this nationalist politics reached its peak. The Turkish, so the settlement law, for example, empowered the government to dislocate the population of whole regions in order to achieve their Turkification. These national policies were in no means specifically anti-Semitic and affected other non-Muslim minorities and non-Turkish groups like the Kurds uh, much more. Kurds, for example, encountered much more repression in terms of both their numbers and the level of violence. Nevertheless, these policies foremost occupational restrictions 
but also the intimidating climate, led to a mass emigration of, Jew of Jews. About a third to half of the Jews left Turkey during this time. At the same time, the dictatorial character of the regime was also reinforced. Turkey adopted the unity of party and state, assuming the model of Italian or German fascist states. More than a few leading politicians regarded the fascist regimes of Germany or Italy as models, but still, this admiration was for the nationalist and authoritarian character and not for its politics against the Jews. Government policy and public opinion in Turkey regarding anti-Semitism was ambiguous. During these years, classes of Zion and Hitler and um, Ford and um, Fritsch were translated into Turkish, sometimes bankrolled by Germany. And there were some ardent anti-Semites like Cevat Rafat Atilhan, who was in contact with the Nazis. And for example, here you can see um, he published cartoons that were taken from the Stürmer directly. And he sometimes even published them prior than they were published in Germany, proving that he was in contact with them. But you also can see there's a difference because it was adopted to Turkey with a, a mosque instead of the church and the woman with the headscarf. But still, Turkish authorities repeatedly banned anti-Semitic publications. And for example, uh, the journal by Cevat Rifat Atilhan, Mili Inklab, which means National Revolution, was forbidden although he was told it will be forbidden, so he had time enough to distribute it. So it was ambivalent. Atilhan might be considered as an extremist, and he was also publicly harsh criticized by many Turkish intellectuals. Nevertheless, anti-Semitic stereotypes began to find their way into mainstream publications. The Nazis, or the German racist hatred for Jews, with its call for extermination, was unambiguously rejected by the Turkish public. Turkish officials were always eager to underline that there was no anti-Semitism in Turkey. Inanay gave a speech like this. This is, for example, a declaration by the journalist and, at the same time, member of parliament, Hussein Jahid Yalçın, and that was also they managed to translate it into French and publish it in France also. Which also hints to the fact, as the Polish government in exile, um, political forces in Turkey considered the Jews being very powerful, so they had always to underline there is no anti-Semitism. This is also sometimes the result of an anti-Semitic thought considering the Jews as the biggest power, but anyway. It was still openly uh, Nazi uh, publications were either not admitted to Turkey or uh, didn't find any uh, support. Nevertheless, for Turkey's Jews, the years between 33 and 45 constitute the darkest, darkest period of their history. Three events had particularly dramatic consequences for the Jews of Turkey. The anti-Jewish riots in Trace, which is the European part of Turkey, in late June, early July of 34, when Jews of Trace were forced by threats, boycotts, and violent attacks to leave their homes, and in some places occurred real pogroms. Several thousand Jews fled to Istanbul, or left the country for Palestine or Bulgaria or Greece. And it's important because this was a region whose Jewish communities had a very significant and very long history. Edirne alone had had 14 synagogues until the end of the Ottoman Empire and produced numerous Jewish scholars. 
The most drastic measure affecting the minorities and especially the Jews in Turkey was the wealth tax, Valik Vergisi, a special tax that was justified with the shortages caused by the war economy. Officially, this tax was to be levied from all business owners and self-employed people, but the taxes for non-Muslims were assessed many times higher than those for non-Muslims, often reaching astronomical levels, 100 times higher than the uh, uh, tax for Muslims. Those incapable of raising said sums and their, had their property out auctioned off. In Istanbul, close to 2,000 people, mostly Jewish, some Armenians and Greeks, were arrested and deported for slave labor in a region near the Russian border. The wealth tax did not only affect Jews, as I just mentioned, but the majority of those deported to camps were Jews, although their figure was smaller than Armenians at the time. And the introduction of the Valik Vergisi was accompanied by an anti-Semitic press campaign in 42. So there was now a very openly anti-Semitic campaign. In December of 43, the deportees were released, and some months later, the law of the Warlick Vergisi was resigned, but the assets until today were never given back. So far for Turkish tolerance towards Jews, let's now have a look on the alleged politics of rescue. Among the first measures taken by the Nazis in Germany was the dismissal of Jews and political opponents from universities and cultural institutions. As a result, no, at the very same time, Turkey was eager to attract internationally renowned scientists and scholars and artists in order to build or modernize its academic institutions. As a result, from 33 onwards, a number of German Jewish, as well as politically persecuted scholars, found employment in Turkey. Several publications on this academic exile and memories by some of the former immigrants, with a certain Orientalist touch to seeing Turkey as a very exotic exile, so almost everybody who went there wrote on it. Um, and the figure or the big number of these publications um, contributed to the impression that Turkey was an important country of exile. But it's not true. Several attempts by Jewish groups as well as individuals, for example, Chaim Weizmann or um, Albert Einstein or others, to persuade Turkey to take in a larger number of Jewish academics failed. The main aim of Turkey's policies was the rejection of Jewish refugees. Already in May of 37, the Turkish Foreign Office issued a secret brief aimed at preventing the immigration of Jews who were, according to the above mentioned settlement law, regarded as unwanted elements. At about the same time, Turkey started to expel non-prominent Jewish refugees from Turkey and in 38 suggested to the Germans to mark passports of German or Austrian Jews with a secret sign. Of course, Turkey was not the only country. It was at the head of the time. <laughs> During the summer of 38, one country after another issued regulations that would prevent Jews from entering. And in July 38, at the conference in Evian, almost all the participating countries declared why their country could not take in any more refugees. And it's more or less like today's refugee politics. It was exact at this time that Turkish government issued a secret decree, number 2, which barred foreign Jews who are subject to restrictions in their home countries from any entry or stay in Turkey, regardless of their present religious affiliation, meaning Turkey directly adopted the definition of Jews or people characterized as Jews by 
German or un other anti-Semitic countries' legisl legislations. As a consequence, Turkish consulates now demanded proof of Aryan descent before granting entry visas. Specialists whose work was essential for Turkish institutions could obtain exceptional permissions to stay in Turkey or even get some family members join them. But this was a very limited option since it required approval by the entire cabinet. And here you can see this is, for example, the, the exception for the mother of uh, Walter Lacour, who was at the um, TIP faculty, say, medical faculty in Istanbul. And you can see there are the signatures of the whole Council of Ministers. So this is already a very limited option. Including family members, there were about 550 to 600 German or Austrian ex Jewish exiles officially admitted to stay in Turkey. This is just over one-tenth of one percent of the approximately 400,000 Jews who left Germany and Austria until immigration was halted in October of 41. Turkey is not even mentioned in any of the pertinent statistics on countries providing refuge. On the contrary, the anti-minority politics of Turkey led some thousand Turkish Jews leaving Turkey during the same period. It should also be emphasized here that Turkey's restrictions towards Jewish refugees were not a result of pressure from Germany. Until 41, Germany's politics was aiming at pressing the Jews out of Germany and not to get them back or halting immigration. So it was more, or Turkey's policies were more a result of its own nationalist politics and population engineering. After the beginning of the war, Ankara's policy of refusing persecuted Jews entry into Turkey had fatal consequences also for Jews from the countries of Eastern Europe. When the Mediterranean and in 41 the Black Sea became a theater of war, the only escape route to Palestine now led through Turkey. In August of 1940, Chaim Ballas was accredited as the representative of the Jewish agency in Turkey. He described the situation in the summer of 1940 as follows. Thousands of Jewish refugees were trapped in Kovno, Bucharest, and other European cities. They had passports and immigration visas to Palestine and had been promised Syria visas. The only obstacle remaining was the prohibition against their passage by Turkey. Restrictions were just one factor, others were the policies of Great Britain or the Germans afterwards efforts to close off Jewish escape routes. After tough negotiations in January of 41, the secret decree that I have mentioned was eventually somewhat relaxed and Turkey permitted now Jews who had received Palestine certificates prior to the war passage. Although the decree expressly begins with the sentence, Jews who are subject to restrictions in their life and freedom in their home countries are prohibited from entering Turkey, quote, and, and lists only a handful of narrowly defined exceptions, it is mistakenly mentioned in several publications on rescue activities as a decree permitting persecuted Jews entry into Turkey. In fact, during one year, 4041, 4,800 4, Jews who held Palestine certificates from the time prior to the war and met several other conditions could effectively transit Turkey. But after these, this huge group had transited Turkey, or it was not one group, but these specific people, Ankara only allowed a small number of Jews per month to pass through Turkey. 
and finally Turkey was more or less a needle's eye with regard to rescue activities. The most well-known consequence of this politics is the history of the Struma that reached Istanbul on Decem December 15, 1941. With a broken engine and completely overloaded, like a lot of the Aliabet uh, vessels were. It was carrying 765 Jewish refugees, most of whom had fled the mass slaughter in Romania. Turkey's authorities refused the passengers to disembark, although Jewish ref relief organizations offered to assume all costs for housing until these people would get permission to continue. On February 24, the vessel without a working engine was towed into the open seas. Only a short time later, it was struck by a Soviet torpedo and went down. With the exception of David Stolyar, who managed to save himself by swimming, all refugees died off the coast of Istanbul. Although this ship has been seen from the, from the, from the port of Istanbul, you could see it. After this disaster, Turkey continued its restrictive politics, although the consul in Bucharest reported on the mass slaughter in Romania. Turkey only changed its stance in the summer of 1944, when Germany's coming defeat was apparent, was clear, and Romania and other countries had broken with the Nazi regime, and the Balkan was more or less liberated. So if you look at the figures, this is by Dania, uh, Daria Ofer. Uh, she mentions, on, based on the sources of the Jewish agency, 16,400 Jews passed through Turkey. But if we have a closer look, we see three th more than 3,000 of these are not refugees, but Jews from Turkey, leaving Turkey. 4,400, the group I've mentioned, in the year of 4041. Uh, 40, and 1,000 from Greece, who were not allowed, who just, that was a special escape route on small kikes. So actually, in the crucial years, 42 and 43, only 1,000 Jewish refugees were admitted or received official Turkish visas, transit visas. And of course, Turkey was not the only country that did not admit refugees. But after 42, 43, when the knowledge on the mass killings and on the reality or on, on the um, genocide was known, Turkey was the only country among the neutrals that did not allow refugee camps. Portugal, Spain, and Switzerland, and Sweden in these years changed their approach. Turkey was the only country not to do so. The nationalist policies of Turkey had likewise profound consequences for the 20,000 to 30,000 Jews from Turkey living in Europe. Compared with Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, they were a clear small minority. If we consider, however, that by 35, there were a mere 75,000 Jews left in the Turkish Republic, these Turkish exile communities become more significant. They constituted a much larger group than the entire Jewish population of Turkey today. The bulk of Turkish Jewish immigrants lived in Paris, where they founded no fewer than four Turkish Sephardic synagogues and numerous cultural and social associations. Which is interesting because in Turkey at the very time, all ethnic or religious uh, activity of non-Turkish, non-Muslim groups was forbidden, and Jews had to adopt Turkish names, not to speak Ladino in, in the public. And for the very short time now, for this 10 years, 
in the interwar period, pa Paris emerged as the new center of Sephardic culture. And it's interesting, here this is the um, carpet uh, repair or rug repair shop by Nissim and Esther Sefira in Brussels and their son, Chaim Vidal Sefira, may be known to some of you because he became a professor on Judeo Espanol in Paris. He would not like me to say Ladino because it's Judeo Espanol. Okay. After the subsequent occupation of European countries by Nazi Germany, these Turkish Jews were also subjected to the Nazi Germany's measures against Jews. But protests by various foreign diplomats, among them Turkish diplomats, forced the Germans to take foreign policy considerations into account. And this led to a collaboration between the Reichssicherheitshauptamt and the foreign ministry and to the defining of hierarchies of persecution for Jews of various groups and nationalities. For a certain time, until 43, Jews from neutral or German allied countries like Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary enjoyed exceptions from several anti-Jewish measures, for example, wearing the star, and from deportation. This is similar to what the groups within the German Jews, war veterans or Jews married to non-Jewish spouses, had some exemptions. So as a neutral country that played a significant role in the German war effort, Turkey had enormous means to protect its Jewish citizens living in European countries. Some Turkish diplomats repeatedly and successfully intervened, used this and successfully intervened on behalf of Turkish Jews, at times even gaining their release from concentration camps. And the example of the Consul General of Rhodes, Selahattin Ülkümen, shows in some cases, simply acknowledging a Jewish person's Turkish citizenship could be enough to save his or her life. But in contrast to the efforts of individual diplomats in the field, the main rationale behind Ankara's policies towards Turkish Jews under Nazi rule was to prevent their re-immigration to Turkey. And one of the methods to prevent it was stripping them of citizenship. As we know from the example of Poland and other nationalist countries in Eastern Europe during this period, <coughs> stripping Jews and unwant other unwanted parts of the population was not unique to Turkey and not something only connected to the, the Germans' persecution of the Jews. Hannah Arendt spoke of Jewish refugees Jews as a stateless people. Turkey also, already in the mid-30s, had begun to strip many of its Jewish nationals abroad and also within the country of their citizenship. A series of laws and decrees enabled the Turkish government to deprive unwanted parts of the population of their Turkish citizenship. And this is an example which is based on a law that allows or um, enables the government to decide who is Turkish by, its, by his or her culture. And so three Jewish families within Turkey are stripped of citizenship for bad behavior, um, which is not clearly defined. And these were people living in Turkey. But still, this policy was at first unconnected to German, Germany's persecution of the Jews. Rather, it was part of the Turkification policies and aimed at preventing a return of Armenians, legalizing the appropriation of their assets. Expatriation, um, stripping of citizenship, sorry, began to be used primarily against Jews only after the persecution of the Jews by the Nazis had begun, and when Jews living in Western European countries occupied by Germany, became critically dependent on the protection afforded by their citizenship. And here we have a document that shows that it's not only an accident. You see there's Yahudi, which is Turkish for Jew, 
and it's a handwritten note under the word Yahudi Jew, you have the law which are used to strip Jews from citizenship. So, of course, this is not a proof or a smoking gun, but it's at least it hints to the fact that this was not only accidentally. It is sometimes argued that this politics of depriving Jews from citizenship targeted only Jews who since generations had no connections with Turkey. This is not true, as several examples prove. For example, Davisko Asriel, the last president of the Turkish Sephardi congregation at Berlin, was at the same time a member of the Turkish Chamber of Commerce in Berlin, and I have the minutes from this association proving that he was sitting next to the consul at several uh, of their meetings. So he was somebody in close contact, and he was stripped of citizenship in 40, and then as a stateless among the first Jews from Berlin to be deported. When the Germans, in, oh, this is still the other one, back, sorry. When the Germans, in collaboration with the Vichy police, started mass arrests of foreign Jews in France in the summer of 41, German and French authorities often sent the Turkish consulate lists of the names of the Turkish Jews who had been arrested, asking for the confirmation of their citizenship. This was when in the November of 41, these hierarchies that I meant, may have mentioned before, and these rules of exemptions for new Jews from neutral countries had been defined. So in the winter 41-42, all the neutral consulates got these lists, and they could choose whom they would um, accept as their nationals. I also found several letters and correspondence between Turkish Jews detained in camps in France to their families, in which these persons desperately asked their spouses or relatives to contact the consulate and achieve the approval of their Turkish citizenship. And I also found notes of Turkish consulates refusing the approval, saying, not he is not a Turkish citizen, but we are about to strip him of his citizenship. This was in the winter of 42. So, of course, it's important to stress that in this period, in the winter 41-42, Turkish authorities did not know that deportation to the East meant murder. But at the end of 42, they knew. The inter-allied declaration was from December of 42. And at the end of 42, the Germans set an ultimatum to neutral or German-affiliated countries to repatriate their Jewish nationals living in German-occupied countries. Otherwise, these Jews would be, quote, subjected to the general measures against the Jews. And meaning, deportation, and murder, which, of course, was not put in wording. Turkey, as some other neutral countries, first did not react at all. Only in March 43, 112 Jews, mainly men in military age, out of a list of 4,000 that has been given by the Germans, were sent to Turkey. Instead, and I have the documents, Ankara ordered its diplomats in Europe not to send the Jews back to Ankara or to Turkey. So Turkey and other neutral countries did not react, and this deadline was reset for several times until September of 43. At the end of September 43, just a day prior to the extended deadline, and at a time when it was known that deportation meant death. And this was also like, in a um, journal by the Turkish Foreign Ministry. They quote what, they quote, don't quote the inter allied declaration, but they quote Eden saying, German are killing the Jews 
in masses in Poland. So they knew what they did. The Turkish envoy to Berlin, Koch, explained to his German counterpart that Turkey would now allow those Jews to return to Turkey who could prove their regular citizenship. But Ankara's main concern was still, quote, to prevent a mass immigration of Jews to Turkey, even of those who retained their citizenship but lacked ties to Turkey. And still, they were accorded advices from Ankara to consulates in France saying, those who are in military age can come back, and those who have family, the other can wait. In the winter of 43-44, several Jewish organizations learned about the fate of Turkish Jews in France and tried to urge Turkey to allow these Jews to return and to give them at least shelter until the end of the war. For example, in Washington, there was a delegation of several Sephardic Jews from different countries uh, meeting with the Turkish ambassador to the um, to, to, to United States. But Turkey still refused. In the spring of 44, 414 Turkish Jews finally could return to Turkey, Turkey in six trains. This figure is about 10% of the Turkish Jews whose repatriation the Germans had demanded in the ultimatum. Even in April of 45, some weeks before the final surrender of the Germans, the policy to obstruct Jewish entry into the country dominated the decision of Turkish officials. On April 11, 45, 137 Jews of Turkish origin reached Istanbul on the vessel Drottninghorn, together with other Turkish nationals, students and diplomatic personnel. They were liberated from the Bergen-Belsen and Ravensbrück concentration camps, the Jews, not the others, of course, part of an exchange of civilians between Turkey and Germany, because they had um, closed the democrat uh, diplomatic relations. Although the ship docked just as Bergen-Belsen was liberated and news about its horrors were made public in the Turkish press, Turkey initially did not permit most of these rescued Jews to enter Turkey. Only after tough negotiations did international Jewish representatives and the American ambassador, who was, by the way, Jewish, convince Turkish authorities to allow these people to leave the ship and to be interned in three hotels in Istanbul with the Jewish agency covering the costs. Although the racist and murderous anti-Semitism of the Germans was rejected by the political class in Turkey, on the other hand, there was no interest for the fate of the Jews neither, like in a lot of other countries. Judging from the Turkish press coverage government meetings, or published memoirs by Turkish diplomats. To get an impression of the state of mind of Turkey's politicians, I would like to present you a document from the same time, April 45. On April 5, 1945, just uh, some days before the arrival of the Drottingham, a Turkish Jew by the name of Yasef Altener wrote to his friend in Merzifon, which is also not far from Ankara, or in Anatolia. This letter that you can read reflects the emotional reaction of Jews who only now learned about the dimensions of the genocide of the European Jewry. Erroneously, the writer of the letter believes that the Jewish community received this information directly by Roosevelt. Anyway. Secondly, it gives us a hint to the impoverishment of the Jews in Turkey during World War II, mainly as a result of the Walik Vergesi. The big majority of the Turkish Jewish community depended on aid by international organizations, mainly the joint. For me, however, the most interesting point is not the letter itself, 
but the accompanying note by the Minister of Defense of, Turkish, of Turkey to the Turkish Prime Minister. The correspondence between the two friends was monitored by the Turkish military intelligence. That's why it ended up in the archive, and that's why I found it. <laughs> um, and forwarded personally to the minister of, to the Turkish prime minister with a note that, quote, the American president is closely interested in the Jews of Turkey, quote, end, which he obviously considered as a concern for Turkish security. It's important at the time this note was written, Turkey was allied with the United States and at war with Germany. About 2,500 Jews from Turkey, living in several European states, including former Turkish citizens, were murdered by the Germans. After the war, surviving Turkish Jews in France and Belgium voiced their bitter disappointment with Turkey, which through its passive policy had delivered the Jews to the German murderers. The indifference of all Turkish governments since 45 today to the fate of the Turkish Jewish victims of the Shoah is illustrated, for instance, by the fact that to this day, no Turkish government agency or any other scholar in Turkey had taken the trouble to compile the names of the victims and to ascertain their fate. Even though nearly all Jewish families in Turkey have relatives or had had relatives in Europe who were concerned by the Shoah. Holocaust reception in Turkey today. The Holocaust, as it is true for many countries, never became a topic in Turkey. It took another 40 years for the Turkish political class to discover the Jews as a useful topic. The second half of the 1980s sees several important events. The systematic viola violation of human rights in Turkey after the military putsch in 1980 and the repression against the Kurdish population became an almost permanent topic on international boards. The genocide on the Armenians also started to become a topic in several countries whereupon Turkey heavily enforced its campaign for denial. At the same time, Turkey urged for membership in the European Union, so it needed international support. On the other hand, at almost the same time, Jews in Turkey became subjected to aggressive, aggressive anti-Semitism from rightists, Islamists, and also leftist circles. In 19 86, 22 people were killed in an attack on the Neve Shalom Synagogue in Istanbul, which urged the Jewish community to search for protection. And one of the results was the founding of the 500 Years Foundation, a common association both of Jewish and Muslim businessmen and personalities in order to prepare celebrations of the 500th anniversary of the welcoming of Sephardic Jews. 14 1992. With the participation of Turkish diplomats, a similar association was set up as a branch in the US. And these linked foundations were to become a major Turkish lobby organization. The campaign for Turkish to, to promote the story of Turkish tolerance towards Jews was professionally organized by one of the biggest promo promotion companies in the US. It was in this context that the foundation to contact to Stanford Shaw, a historian on Ottoman history known as an ardent denier of the Armenian genocide. In 1993, Shaw published the book, Turkey's Role in Rescuing Turkish and European Jews, Jewry from Nazi Persecution. It's apparently written on demand. It's very quickly and poorly written and has a lot of historically mistakes. And the title shows that the focus is not the fate of the Jews, but the role of Turkish officials. Interesting enough, Shaw's engagement in Turkish politics was not limited, limited to denying the Armenian genocide. In the same time, 
during the 90s, when investigations were initiated in the U.S. into locating the gold stolen from Jews by the Nazis, Turkey came under suspicion as one of the countries, alongside with Switzerland and other countries, that aided the Germans in transferring the looted gold. Interesting enough, it was Stanford Shaw who gave testimony in favor of Turkey and suggested successfully that the investigation should be closed. Although his book has been contested by internationally scholars shortly after his publication, it became the Turkish official version with the claim that I discussed above and was to become the blueprint for a bunch of further publications. For example, the film Desperate Hours, the book The Ambassador that was also translated into English and a document collection by the retired diplomat Bilal Shimshir and several novels. And one of the last examples of this kind of self-representation in the film Turkish Passport mentioned above, and uh, which is really, it's the official Turkish version and you can see um, the only Holocaust story with a happy ending, which is a blame for the Jews in my, because there is no happy story in the Holocaust. And just to show you how unserious it is, there is uh, I mentioned the consul in Rhodes, Ülkümen, when I talked about rescue. He was stationed in Rhodes. And everybody who knows a little bit on Balkan and Greek Jewry knows that he was stationed in Rhodes. In the film, they transfer him to Lille, the French town of Lille. Apparently, somebody has told them, il était consul sur Lille which means he was consul on the island, and they had transferred him to Lille, which, by the way, was not then part of France, but of the Belgium occupied. So it's a completely ridiculous film, but it's the official Turkish version. As pointed out above, these claims are not only false, but actually the opposite of the truth. Furthermore, and this is important for me, this kind of statements and publications mirrors a deep disregard towards the Jewish victims, as I just told. Holocaust reception by government circles and in the general public is speaking generally, um, sorry, speaking generally beside these kind of propaganda activities the Holocaust to date is still almost a non-topic. It has never received any scholarly attention. No Turkish academics have done any research, nor have seminal works on the Holocaust been translated into Turkish. Apart from my own book, which only deals with a very special topic, Turkey and the Holocaust, um, there is not one scholarly book on the Holocaust translated into Turkish. Some autobiographies like Anne Frank or Primo Levi and um, books on reception of the Holocaust. And interesting enough, Rethinking the Holocaust by Yehuda Bauer has been translated because in this book he still denies the Armenian genocide. So it is quite clear why they translated it. Recently I came across a survey named quote, the international status of Holocaust education, a global mapping by the UNESCO and the Georg Eckert Institute in Braunschweig. To my utmost surprise, Turkey is mentioned in the survey as a country that treats the Holocaust by name as a genocide. But looking at the textbook, the source that is given in the book, uh, and this is the only school book dealing with the topic. We can read the following, and I won't read it, but if they just mix everything up, this is the only mentioning of the Holocaust or of the, of the topic in one Turkish textbook. And if you read this, you can think, oh, the Germans were the third most groups of victims. Looking at statements by politicians or non-scholarly publications, 
by state agency or financed by them, we can observe the following. First, there is really no serious approach, no investigation, investigation in the fate of Jews. All these accounts reduce the Jews to passive objects of rescue by heroic Turkish diplomats. The fate of the Jews during the Shoah doesn't matter. They don't have a personality, and they are just extras for heroic Turkish diplomats. This disrespect is topped by the way how the figure of rescue Jews is just multiplied and played with, from 2,000 to 20,000 to 30,000, producing an inflation of rescue Jews. This alone shows his fundamental disrespect for Turkish Jewish victims. Furthermore, the topic of the Holocaust is constantly used or abused in order to deny the genocide on the Armenians. The close linkage between the denial of the Armenian genocide and Turkey's dealing with the topic of the Holocaust becomes obvious by persons like Stanford Shaw, Bilal Shimshir, the diplomat I've just mentioned. He has 10 books denying the Armenian genocide and two books with sources on the Holocaust claiming the rescue. He's Lowry, uh, and so on. Emir Kivajik, he's a grandson of a diplomat who claims that his um, granduncle rescued 20,000 Jews. He was presented by the Turkish president Gül at the time to Shimon Paris in order to get Israel support for the denial of the Armenian genocide. And there you can read genocide story of my grandfather, the best reply to genocide allegations. In December of 2012, the Turkish embassy in Germany organized in cooperation with other Turkish organizations a mourning ceremony at the memorial state of the former concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. During the event, a memorial plaque for the Jewish and non-Jewish Turkish citizens who were murdered in Bergen-Belsen was unveiled, and an imam, in addition to a rabbi, said a prayer, prayer. Neither the embassy nor any of the Turkish organi organizations involved had any real interest in the fate. They didn't even look for them or investigate them. Apart from the Armenian Garabetarchian, who was also killed in Bergen-Belsen, all the others were Jewish. To qualify these victims as Jewish and non-Jewish Turks is nothing but a form of historical revisionism. The commemorative event in Bergen-Belsen appears as a self-serving attempt to recast the Turkish Muslim majority society as victims or to Muslimize the victims of the Shoah posthumously. Turkey is not the only country that for international propaganda purposes had fabricated a myth about its supported rescue of Jews. Soon after World War II, Spain developed a similar line of propaganda aimed at breaking its international isolation during the years of Franco. Argentina did the same during its area of military dictatorship. And in recent years, we can observe an abuse of Holocaust commemoration and rewriting the history by several European countries, Hungary or Lithuania, or even on a more sophisticated level in Germany. I could conclude with a somehow sarcastic statement that Turkey, with its politics, fits well into Europe. Thank you. You're supposed to be the respondents. Yes. So before we start the, the questions uh, of the audience, I think you should okay. respond. So I will be quite short. Um, well, obviously, I would like to thank Cory uh, for her lecture. And to start with, uh, Cory and I, we have been knowing each other for more than 30 years, so I'll skip the formalities. Um, so this was obviously a very uh, interesting lecture, which with a lot of new information on the historical, a lot of uh, historical information, which is new to most of us here in the... Um, um, in the room, 
But then there are also a couple of uh, questions which might be a bit more familiar to us, uh, to people who work at the Van Lee Institute who, who come visit uh, the Van Lee Institute. So a couple of weeks ago, we had an exhibition here at the Van Lee Institute in the Polanski building on uh, the question of what to do with Holocaust memory 70 years after Auschwitz. And the title of the, um, of the exhibition was at the same time um, a question to all of us, what is memory? And the answer uh, the exhibition gave was precisely that there is no real answer, right? And, uh, but what we see uh, with Corey's lecture is that this question is perhaps far more political than it uh, might uh, look at first sight. So we see that um, uh, what happens if um, remembrance uh, is channeled into one direction and uh, how the abuse of Holocaust can operate. And as uh, Corey rightly uh, said, this is not a topic specific to Turkey, but actually a hints at a general crisis of memory in Europe. Right? But obviously our topic today, our subject, prime subject is Turkey, and so I will um, ask four questions pertaining to the subject Turkey and the Holocaust. So the first one is the question of uh, the myth and the how this myth of Turkey saving Jews can be so resistant. The French historian Paul Wayne wrote a book with the title, Did the Romans Believe in the Myths? And if he had written the, the book, Did the Turks Believe in the Myth of uh, Rescuing Jews? The answer would have been quite clear, I think. Right? So the facts are actually uh, pretty much clear from the very beginning. And then uh, there have been, obviously, the seminal works by Cori on this question, which simply disapproved the idea that there has been a mass rescue carried out by Turkish diplomats of uh, Jews during the Second World War. But nevertheless, this myth uh, continues. So the question is why? Is it because people are particularly stupid? Or is it because they are particularly naive when it comes to Turkey and the Jews? The second question um, pertains to what I would perceive a little bit as a, as a contradiction. Now, the official policy of uh, Holocaust remembrance has gained importance in Turkey in the last approximately 15 years or so. So there have been attempts to integrate the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. There have been the first official commemorations uh, in the last years. Um, with the participation of high-ranking government representatives. And on the other hand, um, this same government who uh, dispatched representatives to assist the commemorations of the uh, Holocaust has come under attack for its authoritarian nature and its rising anti-Semitism. So the promotion of official remembrance also coincides with a historical low in the relations between Israel and Turkey least on the diplomatic level. This, uh, my, my third question, the prospects of Holocaust remembrance in Turkey. Now I think it is quite clear that the official policy is necessarily biased and is clearly intended to cover up different problems of Turkish contemporary society. And I wouldn't be too optimistic um, by hoping that there will be something very positive coming out from these official policies. But what about the Holocaust outside the official circuits, independent from the state? And I ask this question uh, because it's a very critical one. It is very critical because the society in Turkey has experienced in the last years, in the last 10 years or even perhaps 15 years, tremendous changes. There is a growing consciousness of the problems of racism in Turkey, and there is a very, very critical engagement with the exclusionary nature of Turkish nationalism. And we also witness a critical engagement with the past, which did not exist in that case in the 80s or even 90s. It started in the 90s, actually. So I think it is pretty safe to say that the society is more advanced than the state in Turkey currently, much more advanced. And we can see this in particular concerning the denial of the Armenian Genocide. Right? Turkish society is far more uh, open to discussions than the state. 
So what are the prospects of Holocaust remembrance in the context of this critical culture of debate? And that leads me to my uh, final question, which is kind of a, a continuation of this uh, third question. Um, to put it bluntly, do we need Holocaust remembrance in Turkey? Right. As um, Corey um, rightly has shown in her lecture, the, the treatment uh, experienced by the Jews during the 30s and 40s was not specifically anti-Jewish. It was um, obviously not devoid of anti-Semitism, but it took part in a more general policy uh, directed against minority citizens, citizens who appeared as not being entirely worthy of belonging to the Turkish nation. And numerically, the treatment of Jews is nothing compared to the plight of the Kurdish population. In contemporary Turkey, perhaps one of the least known but most important uh, problems is the discrimination of the Alevi population. And of course, there is the shadow of the Armenian Genocide, foundational act of the state of Turkey, is a shadow which looms on Turkish society still today. So Turkey, in a certain way, has more than enough indigenous catastrophes and very acute problems to cope with. And in how far would it make sense in this context to deal with the Holocaust? Or perhaps to put it, put it a little bit more positively, what can Holocaust tell us, Holocaust remembers, yeah. do in this critical debate? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ada, for these very interesting and good questions. Um, so first, why is this myth so resistant? First of all, those of us who are historians, we know about the power of myth. Still today in France, every 14th July, there are people going on the streets saying that was the day when the prisoners in the Bastille were liberated, and we know there were no political prisoners. So myths are part of public memory. Um, but, and it's good that you pose this question because I don't want to be, be misunderstood at, is it as if it is only a Turkish-Jewish conspiracy spreading this myth. There are a couple of, a bunch of different factors. For example, in the beginning in Germany, there were small groups with good intentions. We know the way to hell is paved by good intentions fighting against the abolishing of the asylum right in Germany. Human rights activists saying, oh, we can't abolish the asylum right in Germany because our refugees went to Turkey, which is, uh, there were about a million refugees in Germany and 500 Turkish Jews admitted to Turkey, so, and they were immigrants. But still, these people had good intentions to promote refuge in Turkey. Other people, still with good intentions, try to do something against Islamophobia in Turkey, in, in Germany or in Europe more general, and say, look, these Islamic countries uh, opened or worked together with Jews and were more tolerant, which is for some parts in history true. Rescue stories are more sexy. So people in Yad Vashem, you know about it, um, or for example, one of the stories which I did not mention, and I'm not going to go in here, um, Michael Berenbaum, then chief of United States Holocaust Mori Museum, produced the story of Nejdet Kent, which is not true, by the way, and he could have known it, but apparently it's very attractive to have, oh, such a wonderful rescue story. So it's really a bunch of different things that comes together. In Turkey, some of the Jews who were, lib oh, a very important thing is only the people who survived can speak. We only know their stories. So in general, the people who perished can't give us testimonies. Meaning already among those who survived, those who survived by aid of somebody, either church or Turkish consulate, is much bigger. And this gives a very 
wrong perspective very often if you have te if you read only testimonies by survivors. I think in books of you should leave 100 sheets blank to show there's one who survived and the other 100 did not. And finally, in Turkey, some of the Turkish Jews feel um, courted by the fact when they are interviewed every day. I have the very proof that two of, they passed away, by the way, but two of the Turkish Jews who always gave testimony that were, they were rescued by Turkish consulates, I found the documents that they were released for medical reasons. But apparently, under the pressure in Turkey, it was very attractive for them to be in the center of such a nice rescue story. And finally, I think there's also something we can, it's a question to you, you know more on Israel as I do. I think the interest of the Zionist movement in Israel to have good relations with Turkey also played a role from the very beginning. We have people like Ben Gurion or um, Ben Svi or um, Moshe Sharet who had close links to Turkey and I think this also affected maybe the, pub, the public memory in Israel. I, I, I'm not so sure. So far for the first question. I will try to make it shorter for the second one. <laughs> um, why the Holocaust has made a topic under the AKP. The so first of all, it didn't start with the AKP, although there are more activities now. Actually, it was the government prior to the Islamist AKP government who fostered Turkey to be a become a member in the IHRA, hoping this would trigger Turkey's Turkey being a member of becoming a member of the European Union. Um, but I think if you, I'm thinking loudly. It's not something very um, uh, that I have finished to think on. Uh, I think it's very dangerous. It promotes the idea that the Jews govern the world. The idea that, oh, if you want to become a member of the European Union, you have to commemorate the Holocaust. To be a member of the Western world, even if you are anti-Semitic and you hate the Jews, everybody knows you hate the, Jew the Jews, like Jamie Cicek, the one who gave the, delivered the speech. Uh, but it's chic or it belongs to the customs of the Western world to commemorate the Holocaust without believing. So I think this is a very dangerous thing, which actually traps back or can, because it, I don't know, I'm not so sure, but I think it could even um, enforce anti-Semitic things because it fosters the thinking of, oh, the Jews control the world, thinking so you have to play the game, be a member of the Western world. Um, and this leads me also to your third question. It's interesting, there is really a growing alternative democratic and critical history, mo historical uh, movement on history in Turkey by scholars of some private universities, but also by grassroots um, association like um, small groups in, in, in the quarter of Istanbul, Yüzleştirme Atölyesi, uh, which means atelier to confront history, people searching for former Armenian neighbors. Um, in the, within the Kurdish region, there is oral history on the former Armenian people living there, and so on, and so on. It's, it's, it, it's not even possible to is, resume this in, in 10 minutes. So, and interesting enough, uh, within these groups, the Holocaust is more or less seen as a tool of the government. So they don't deal with it because they say it's always used from the other side. So we have the Armenian genocide, we have the local genocide on the Kurds, Kurdish Alevis in, in Dersim. Let's dig for our history. And this is also a response to this hypocritical approach by the government. But we can turn it positively 
Because actually, if these people would have more interest in the Holocaust, the research on the Holocaust delivers so many tools also to research genocide in general. So this would be the answer on your last question. Um, and for example, we edited one uh, special issue of one of the historical reviews, Birikim, to start a comparing discussion on both. Is that an answer? I don't, I, I want to give floor to the people. So I could expand on this, but. Yes, I thought, well, thank you for your uh, presentation. But uh, two, two words uh, were not mentioned here. And it might be that uh, for, for being the devil's advocate for a moment, um, something for the defense of Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, Holocaust denial. Mm -hmm. By the very fact that te official Turkey take pride in, uh, in, 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 in Turkish diplomats who rescued Jews during the Holocaust, etc., etc., Turkey does not deny the Holocaust. Now, this is, I'm not sure that this is something to sneeze at. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind the neighbors of Turkey, where Holocaust denial is very rampant. And also, it's not a phenomenon that, that, that is very rare in Europe, even. So can you say something about Holocaust denial in Turkey, if it exists? And if not, perhaps a bit, somehow, it balances your, uh, your presentation. But, but really, a bit, not more than this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had no time or opportunity to go into this. First of all, um, it's difficult because Turkey is very often seen because of its Islamic majority as a Near East country. But with its politics, it's also a South East European country. What it did during the Holocaust is more compar comparable, for example, to the politics of Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. um, of course, if they participate in these um, commemoration, it's opposite to denial. There is a strong um, current of denial in Turkey. Um, there are a lot of publications on denial, and even uh, international deniers had been um, promoted by more center press in Turkey. Sabah at the time was. Um, but of course, you're right, it's not the same as, for example, in some uh, uh, Arabic countries. Of course, that's true, yeah. But still, I think there are people who, th who um, I, I would call into question how serious they are if they deal with it, because it's, it's a non-topic, actually. There is not one book or no knowledge. So you can't deny something that you don't know. And of course, it's, there is a strong, even by AKP politi politicians, whenever it comes to Israel, there's, of course, um, let's say, we need a second Hitler or a new Hitler or whatever. And this is, these are not um, people out of the center. These are people, the mayor of Ankara, for example. Really? Uh, I'm not bothered by Turkey promoting a certain image as, uh, I mean, has rescued uh, Jews, but somebody local who follows the academic uh, uh, scholarly works here and the press, I, I think uh, there is a big element of uh, complicity of Israel in this uh, distorting of the image. And I'm a little shocked because I have had respect for Israeli academic uh, work that for 40 years uh, they are more or less aiding or promoting the same image as Turkey is doing. So here there is more politics than academics. That's my comment. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Corey, for your um, remarks. Um, of just a few comments. One is that um, clearly memory is a tool. 
It is used by many different countries around the world, and uh, Bulgaria certainly is a perfect example of uh, they're um, trying to, again, the difference between what is going on in universities, perhaps, or versus what's going on with the government and what kind of exhibitions that they promote and the uh, history that they like to deny is all very common. And as we know, in Western Europe as well, this is a common denominator. And certainly knowledge and history versus memory is, is very different. I do think, though, that we, there's a few things that we have to put into context and maybe as op also opportunities. One is that the Turkish academics that we have worked with at Yad Vashem, many of them have worked abroad with their dissertations. This clearly is an opening which is very important because we understood that young academics from Turkey who, again, studied in France, in the United States, in England, and other places were exposed many times to Holocaust memory, were exposed to many things that they had never heard of before, and it piqued their interest. And this, I think, also is an important element in gradually the younger generation of academia. Again, it's a long way to go, but there is, as you said, a, a definite growing seed here. Second is, again, the problem with the textbooks. Not only are they not mentioning anything about the Shoah per se, but they're, in general, from what we know, textbooks in Turkey about history basically go up to Ataturk. And there's not much at all about world history. And in fact, if one wants to learn about world history, as far as I know, as of right now, it's an elective for very few, very few people who even know that they can take it. So again, that's a general problem in general with learning about modern world history that has nothing to do necessarily with Turkey per se. In terms of you, what your com comment is in, in about the anti-Semitism, there are also Israelis who, by the way, who use that element of anti-Semitism in order to, as if try and, as if gain an agenda so that they can, in, in fact, have a connection with those who may not be interested. So it does work both ways. There are those who do that. And though I do understand what you're trying to get at, and believe me, we agree. However, because there's the issue of the opportunity, when I know that someone in the Inca school system named James McMillan takes students to Auschwitz-Birkenau after working with them for six months to prepare them, I have to say, even though perhaps it may be a small glimmer of light, if he can do something with 20 students over a period of a couple of years, then I see that as maybe a small thing, but at least a beginning. And I, of course, as an educator, I have to be positive, otherwise I might as well just you know, go home and that's the end. But at the same time, I'm hoping that even opportunities, even when the government doesn't support necessarily programming and that they, because of the Israeli, uh, the breakdown in relations with Israel. On the other hand, there are those, as you said, the grassroots, and if we can connect with them, absolutely, I think we have no choice but to. This was a comment and uh, not a question, so I... It was just a comment to add to the... Yeah. Just a short comment or a short response to the textbooks. I think this takes up what you said. Uh, for example, the Minister of Education calls for competitions on denying the Armenian genocide. So, um, of course, there are problems that are more, much more evident in Turkey than what they write on, on, the, on the Holocaust. You know? So it's racist in many perspectives. And yeah. um, Isn't it uh, part of the um, movement in Turkey um, to bring uh, this, uh, I don't know if it's a myth or truth, that uh, most of the European values were generated and given by Turkey to Europe in the sense that uh, the different customs from the Ottoman Empire infiltrated uh, to Europe. Because it seems to me that um, the interest of Hitler in Turkey was 
much beyond uh, the fact that Turkey was neutral. I didn't understand the first part of the question with the... The, the first question, the, the first part means that this is, uh, as you said, memory is, has political interests. Mm -hmm. And Turkey has an interest, uh, Turkey was denied uh, European uh, membership. Mm -hmm. And they developed a myth that Turkey gave Europe uh, values of culture that Europe didn't have. Ah, okay, I see, yeah. Or oh, there are different things, um, different layers. So first of all, uh, before going into this, um, this also touches on what you said. Um, this story is used by completely opposite forces. For example, prior to the AKP, it was a uh, Kemalist movement. They put, they exactly copied passages of the book by Stanford Shaw. Although normally the Kemalist movement rejects the Ottoman history, all of a sudden the Ottoman tolerance became a topic. So it's just using, playing with things. And it's true, of course, uh, what the Jews in Turkey never faced something like the Jews in Europe, ne near, uh, neither in the Middle Ages nor during the Shoah. So, of course, uh, if you compare this, Turkey is clearly diff much different from all European countries. But, um, and in our days, it's also part of the new Ottoman, re rewriting Ottoman history, um, saying in Ottoman times, everybody was very happy and we, had, we lived together. It was a multicultural paradise for all groups of society, which is part of the AKP propaganda. Um, Okay. Is that an, an answer? Well, it, it's sort of an answer, but uh, my interest is more sort of uh, since you want to get access to uh, documents in Turkey, mm -hmm. and Turkey wants to get access to the European Union. Turkey always promises, we, let's see, maybe at the end of the year they will open one archive, there is still hope. Uh, last and final question. Yeah? When the story about rescue of the European Jews by Turkey was born in the 50s, 60s? No, in the 80s. 90s. In the 80s. In the 80s. Yeah, I told you. I try to develop the reasons. Prior to this, this hasn't been any topic. But if you produce our history, never comes from the heaven. You have always used something. And at the end of the Ottoman period, there was a similar situation that the Jews within Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire, came under pressure mainly from the Christian groups, anti-attacks by Greek and Orthodox Arabs, also by some Armenians. So this forced Turkish Jew, uh, Ottoman Jews to search protection by the state. And within this period, there was a myth of Ottoman Jewish um, friendship and Good the relations. That was in 18. That was already. Sorry? No, no, prior to this. Yeah, there were all groups were involved. They were not. Uh, this is all. <laughs> it's dangerous because today in Turkey, everybody who wants to blame somebody for the 
Armenian genocide says actually it was made by the Jews because the yeah. Jews were behind the young Turks. This is bullshit. They were some Jews, but there were some uh, people of other nationalities also involved. So that's not. But in 1892, for, for the first time, there was a 400 years celebration. And people, Jews, who actually were not from Sephardic descent, but who had been Sephardized during the long period, all of a sudden commemorated, ate Spanish bread, and so on. They felt, uh, and there was a prayer um, prizing the Sultan in 1892 for the 400 years. But prior to this, nobody had thought of this. So this was a little bit invention of traditions. And when this came in the 1980s, so they had something to build on. And the, excuse me, you consider the Turkey as a Muslim state. You said about in the 30s there were discrimination against non-Muslims. That's a good question. Because of your slide. Yeah. And uh, you repeated such uh, sentences uh, sometimes. Yeah, that's very interesting because actually it was not the ideology or the predominant ideology by the Kemalists was not at all religious, in the contrary. But the um, criteria to distinct mas uh, true Turks, one of the main criteria was the Muslim belief. So, but the Nazis also, not to compare Kemalists and Nazis, not at all, but just as a criteria who was a Jew, they looked for um, the registers of the Jewish community, of the religious community, although they fighted the Jews as a race. So ideolo ideology never, or racism is never very logic, in my perspective. Um, I thank you very much for your fascinating uh, contribution to the understanding of those uh, very painful dynamics. I thank you very much uh, Erdal Kainar for his uh, uh, role as a respondent. And I thank uh, you and I, th I thank the audience for the attention and the um, active participations in the debate. <laughs>